uh, to kick this off, because the talk is Am I Bugging You? with Carol Wyatt Evans, who um, is our chemicals in the environment agent at our extension office, but we usually refer to her as our bug lady. Um, and it's a hoot when you work with Carol, because I have literally walked through the lobby of our office as she does a gender reveal about someone's cockroach for them. It was it was priceless. It's one of those things you hear and you weren't expecting to learn that day. Um, so it's one of the things I like about my job. So thank you so much, Carol, for, for speaking with us today. Um, while we kick this off, uh, Carol had a great idea. Put your favorite bug in the chat. And I know little enough about bugs that I won't be able to tell if it's a true bug or not. And so it'll be cool information. So I'm going to hand it over to you, Carol. Thank you so much. And thank you guys for sticking around. This is awesome. <laughs> and um, just wanted to let you know, so um, so I'm chemicals in the environment. I actually, I really just like my title. I really enjoy doing the insect work. So I do a lot of insect identification. I also do um, a lot of IPM, so integrated pest management. So that's the stuff you guys use during your school gardens. And um, I'd love to, um, I, I'm going to say at the end of the, the, this uh, presentation, but I'm happy to help out um, if you guys need any, any help with your school gardens as far as that, your IPM. Um, plan. Um, if you don't have one, we can make one. I'm, I'm, that's what I'm here for. So again, thank you guys, you guys for being here. And part of this is going to be interactive. And you guys are my guinea pigs for this too. So um, there's going to be some parts that may or may not work, but we'll see. So okay, let me see what am I doing here? I'm gonna, oops, I'm gonna share my screen. See if I can get my presentation going here. <laughs> Can you see that, Mindy? Okay, perfect. And I apologize in advance, and we have a lot of background uh, um, noise going on here, but I'll do the best I can at speaking up. So, okay, today's presentation, am I bugging you? So, so we'll just start out with, so insects rule the world. So really, oh, let me do this. Um, let's see my presentation. So, um, you know, worldwide, there are about a million described species. So those are ones that have already been been found. Um, and that number here in the U.S. is about 91,000. Um, we, we kind of anticipate there's probably another almost half of that to still be, or 100% you know, of that still needs to be described. So they think that there's about 73,000 yet to be discovered. So thinking about that 1 million species worldwide, um, it's estimated that there's about 2 billion insects for the human on Earth. So, you know, when we say insects rule the world, they really do. And when we talk about insects, um, there's only about 2,300 that are really considered pest insects. So these are going to be insects that, you know, do harm directly to us through like vector diseases or through biting us or indirectly by like attacking our food sources, right? or affecting the insects that we need for that food production. So that means that, hello? Sorry, before you switch slides, so two billion for every human? Two billion for every human. So that means, so if you look at an ant hill, right, there can be, there could be, you know, thousands, if not tens of thousands, even, you know, in the hundred thousands of insects within that ant mound. So when you think about all the insects in the world, and then, so all the species, and then all you know, yeah. insects per the, for each species. There's about two billion for every human. So, yeah, <laughs> their biomass by far outweighs us. So, but um, so about 99% of our insects then are beneficial. So um, you know, when we talk about beneficial, it means that they're going to pollinate our food crops or flowers. They feed on other insects, right? So they're going to be uh, our, our biocontrols. They serve as food for other insects in wildlife, or they help to recycle our plant and animal matter. So that really means that the vast majority of insects are beneficial or benign, and many can actually be both. And that depends on how you know how you look at it and what the situation is. So let's take cockroaches for example. So you know most people are like oh cockroaches gross, right? Well, yeah, when they're in our home, they're really bad, right? We don't want them in our homes, but in the landscape, they're really detritivores. And they're a really important contributor to helping break down that organic matter, organic matter, and recycling those nutrients back into the back into the environment. Um, they're also food for other insects and small mammals and birds. So you know, 
if you, you know, it depends on how you look at it. Same with ladybugs. Ladybugs up north, if any of you are from up north, um, you know, during the wintertime, they, they, you know, cohabitate onto the sides of people's houses to stay warm. And so they become a real nuisance pest because you can't even literally get into your door. But down here, we know that ladybugs are a really good uh, biocontrol, right? They, they eat other pest insects. So again, it's the situation and, and uh, you know, it, it depends on whether they're good or bad. Also, um, people are uncertain of insects because they don't know their ecology or, or their ecological value or their life history. And any insects have an immature stage um, that's extremely beneficial in helping to control other pests. So it's really important to be able to identify and understand at least the common insects that are going to be in the garden and in the landscape, and then learn a little bit about their life cycle. And that's going to go a long way into helping us support um, the, uh, you know, the, the birds of the world. So a big problem that insects are faced with are the pesticides that we use. And um, you know, we, you know, we use these pesticides to try to control the insects. Well, um, although we think we're doing the right thing, many times we don't understand that negative consequence uh, or those impacts that these pesticides have on the beneficials. And they end up doing more long-term damage. Um, you know, and so we really have to be cognizant of the things, and the, the pesticides, uh, chemicals that we're using when we're um, spraying, if we're spraying. So here's going to be our first quiz. <laughs> this is just easy. Um, what I'd like you guys to do, uh, she's going to launch, uh, Mindy's going to launch a poll, and it's going to ask, I'm going to ask if whether they're a good or a bad bug. So it's the same question asked six times. So um, Mindy, can you launch that poll? Yes, I will go ahead and launch that. And then okay. um, I, I would say that the um, I think you're being kind to the volume of the office um, and feel free to to speak louder if you can okay sorry yeah i'm, I'm trying <laughs> <laughs> um so hopefully um can you see it i can i think wilma's on wilma can you see it yes i can okay good so i mean there's obviously a right and a wrong answer on this but <laughs> <laughs> and, and we're not going to grade you, but and you're it not is gonna be not. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so, well, we have one response so far. Let's see. Oh, we got two. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, Wendy, go ahead and guess. Um, there's, there's no penalty. Yeah, this is, this is me getting an idea of, of you know, what you know about insects or, you know, because these are all common insects that are in our landscape. So I do not expect you to know them. So I just, it's just a curiosity for me. So we're almost a half. And I guarantee you, I do not know some of these as well. And this is anonymous. So don't worry yeah, we don't connect it to you. <laughs> <laughs> so we have six out of 18. So, um, so let's give it like 10 more seconds. So all you have to do is select good or bad uh, for yeah. each one. And it doesn't mean we're saying that we have to kill the bugs if we call them bad. Yeah, yeah. It's just ones we don't want in our garden, how's that? Okay, we can go ahead and end the poll now. We're almost at 50%. Okay. Some, someday I'll be high tech enough that we'll have like theme music when we want. <laughs> I know, <laughs> little Jeopardy. So, so what do you think show results are you on did? I I did not. I actually closed it. Um, do you want to share? Or? So on this, so we're saying okay. So good bug, very good. So what this this bug is? This is a green lacewing larvae. So you're saying, what's a green lacewing? Well, this is a green lacewing. So this is the adult stage, and this is the uh, the uh, nymph stage, or the larvae stage, sorry. This is a voracious eater. It, these are little aphids, so these are the pest insects. And um, as you notice, his mandibles, or its mandibles, go straight out. So whatever it runs into, it's going to eat. So this is a good bug. This one is tough. 
So we said it was a bad book. This is a tough one, and that's why I put it up here. This is actually a um, ladybug larvae. So it looks like a mealybug, but it's um, the adult stage of this is a black ladybug with two red spots on its, basically on its shoulders. So this is, this is a good guy. This is a big-eyed bug. This is also a, a beneficial insect. Um, eats a lot of chinch bugs. It looks like a chinch bug, so we get a lot of problems with people killing these bugs because they think they have chinch bugs. This one is a parasitoid wasp, and this is that, if we look at here, here's an aphid. This is a, a mummified aphid. So this wasp has laid an egg inside, or a wasp laid an egg inside this aphid, and then this larvae ate it from the inside out, it pupated, and now the, the good wasp is coming out. We've already talked about the, uh, the lacewing. Uh, this is the green lacewing. This is the adult stage. It really eats nectar. So we really like when it lays its eggs and it's, it's the larvae stage is what eats the, um, the pest insects. And then we all know a ladybug. So very good. Okay, so onward down here. There we go. Okay, so insects are successful. We're talking a little bit about why insects are successful. So um, they produce a large number of offspring really quick, and they have multiple generations a season. And that's why in your garden, like when you get aphids and mealybugs, it's like they just seem to like literally overnight, they just bloom. And they really do because their generational time is really, really fast. So many of them, especially those pest insects, increase the populations in a very, very short period of time. And then camouflage. Um, camouflage allows them to blend really well into their environment and they go undetected. So, you know, we might miss them as we're, as we're trying to look for them. Um, others that we see might be really brightly colored and that's called aposmatic coloring. So, you know, we see um, a lot of the caterpillars and um, you know, like that um, oleander caterpillar, the monarch caterpillar, very, very brightly colored. And that's to say, you know, you're not going to be happy when you eat me because I'm either going to make you really sick or I might even kill you. So they have that natural defense. And some of those are mimics, right? They're like, I really don't, but I'm just lying to you. So, um, you know, but most of them, that, that camouflage is really what works really well for them. And then they have that protective outer shell. It's called an exoskeleton. And this heat helps to keep their moisture inside their body, right? They're invertebrates, so they don't have a backbone. So their, their, their um, uh, skeleton really is on the outside of their, of their body. And that exoskeleton is actually made up more of like our fingernails than it is of our bones. So it's, so it's keratin-based and not, not the uh, bone-based. And then they're really small, most, most of them, and they can fly. So that small size and that ability to fly um, allows them a quick escape from their enemies. Also, it allows them to disperse to new environments. So, um, you know, these are all the things that have made in insects successful. But then when we talk about Florida, so um, Florida has about 13,000 native species. Um, I, I'm sorry, 13,000 insect species. And then 15,000 of those are actually native and 1,500 of those are endemic, meaning those are the ones that were here. They can only, you only find them here and they, they you know, they can't find, they, you don't find them anywhere else. So that's just a little bit about the, the, the Florida members. Okay, I'm um, not gonna get into this, but sorry, it's gonna be really loud. Um, but just wanted to uh, take a look at where the insects fall on that uh, phylogenetic tree. So we know that, you know, it's not really a, a, a true cladogram, but you know, here we have that split between the invertebrates and the vertebrates, and we know that the insects are in the in invertebrates. But I really wanted to point out that relationship of the insects to the rest of the invertebrates. So they're a subgroup in the phylum Arthropoda. So insects are most closely related to each other than they are to any any other um, um, insect, or I'm sorry, any other organisms on this, oh, yeah. this uh, chart, but they're, you know, they're close cousins to the arachnids and the crustaceans, but they're also then related, uh, you know, distantly related to worms and the echinodermed mollusks. But just wanted you to kind of get an idea of, you know, where they're at. You know, I'm sure a lot of you know, just, just, you know, putting that out there. 
And then class insect, what actually makes an insect an insect? So insects are more closely related to each other, means that um, they put them in their own order by the characters that define them and make up this group. And so those are things going to be you know, three body parts. So they have a separate head, a thorax, and an abdomen. They have that exoskeleton that we you know, already just talked about. They have segmented body, right? All their joints, they are segmented because they have that hard outer shell. So they have to be able to move. Then they have paired jointed uh, legs, right? Three pairs, so six legs. They do have that digestive circulatory and nervous system, um, similar to ours, but not exactly. And then they breathe by either gills, trachea, or, or sphericals. So those are gonna be along the side. So if you take, you know, back to the cockroach, poor cockroach is always my example. You take a cockroach, you put it upside down in a glass of water. You know, they don't have noses like us. They have sphericals, so they are breathing through the sides of their abdomen. So that cockroach is not going to suffocate because as long as its abdomen is sticking out of the water, it will die from either starvation or dehydration, which seems kind of funny. And then wings. Wings are kind of the, the, the thing that makes an insect an insect. Um, they, for the most part, have two pair of wings. Some of them... Are, are secondarily wingless, meaning at some point they lost wings, like fleas, right? They don't have wings, um, but for the most part, most of them do have wings. Okay, so is it a good bug or a bad bug and the things you need to know? So when you think about the insects in your garden, um, you have to think about their purpose. So what's their job? And the big question is, um, when you do find an insect, are they a good bug or a bad bug? So I already mentioned that only 1% of those insects are truly bad bugs. That leaves us with a whole bunch, 99% um, that are good insects. Oops, sorry. Sorry, when did I do that? <laughs> um, so to narrow down what, um, so those are the good insects and the beneficial ex insects. So to narrow down what it might be, there are two things that you need to do. Um, you need to figure out first what type of a mouth part that the insect has. And you don't really need to pick it up and, and, and see it, you know, right in front of you. Um, most of the time, it's obvious by their size and by the damage that you see um, around the insect. So um, we see separate insects. We, we can separate the insects into two categories, and that's by the way they feed. So there's a chewing mouth part and there's a piercing sucking mouth part. So those chewing mouth parts of the insects um, are, they feed on the plants and they cause a lot of visual damage, but generally that plant can overcome that feeding um, once that insect has, has been removed or flies off, right? So insects that cause chewing damage do not vector or do not transmit any sort of disease or infection to the plant. It just really makes the plant look ugly for a while until it recovers, right? So if you think about a caterpillar, now, you know, the plant doesn't look very good for a while, but it recovers. On the other hand, insects with a piercing sucking insect or piercing sucking mouth part, those are the ones that you really need to worry about, especially in the garden. Um, the damage is hard to see at first because what happens is that that insect, so here's its piercing sucking. So this is its stylet um, or proboscis. And what it does is it pierces that plant and it literally sucks the life juice out of that plant. These insects can vector diseases to our plants. So these are the ones that we have to be most concerned with, especially in the garden. And these tend to be the ones that are the smallest and the hardest to see. So what you end up seeing is, you know, you don't see that, that chewing damage, right? Because they're not going to have chewing mouth parts. All of a sudden you just start seeing a decline in your plant. It's looking kind of yellow and, and splotchy looking. And all of a sudden the plant just declines, you know, really fast enough because you have a major infestation that you didn't know you had. So, um, second thing you know is the life stage. So knowing what life stage it is, whether it's a, an immature larvae or an immature nymph, or is an adult. So knowing the life stage and being able to identify it, get it determine if it's a good bug or a bad bug. So immature stages of bad bugs are easier to control using integrated pest management or IPM practices. Um, we can talk about that later if you want. Um, which would be things like hand picking it off the leaf, um, 
or pruning it off, you know, pruning off the stem if it's really heavily infested. Or if there are just way too many there, IPM also includes that use of, um, of pesticides, the biorational pesticides. So these are, these are minimum risk alternative type pesticides. But you really want to use those as a last resort in controlling the pest insect. Um, and I'm going to talk about those a little bit at the end as well. Um, what you and your students um, should know is that it's important to understand that um, many insects in the immature stage can look very different from the adult. And if it's a beneficial insect and that immature stage actually has a really big appetite for that, for pest insects. So they eat more than the adult. Like, you know, we were talking about earlier, here's the, the lacewing. This is the one that's eating the pest insect. This one is the adult stage is eating nectar. So um, we want to we want to conserve, you know, both of these stages. But a lot of times people are going to want to kill this because they think it looks really ugly and, it, you know, they're afraid of it. Um, not knowing that it's actually a beneficial insect. So, you know, just knowing a general idea of what, what the good bugs look like will, will, will go far in the garden. So let's talk about beneficial insects for a second here. So we now know that only 1% of our insects are pest insects. So the rest are going to be beneficial in some way, right? We can put beneficial insects into buckets. Um, I love when I say this to kids because they're all buckets of bugs, buckets of bugs. <laughs> so um, all of these buckets are beneficial insects, but some of them are more specific and um, are the natural pest controls, which we call our biological uh, pest control agents. So these are things like predators, so things like our, our um, mantids, gray mantids, our lady beetles, and then the, the lace wings. Um, most of them are generalist feeders, so they're going to feed on whatever they come across, and sometimes that happens to be a good insect on occasion. Um, but most of the time, they're also going to be uh, fairly soft bodied. Those, you know, like a ladybug um, larvae and a ladybug adult are only going to eat soft bodied insects like aphids and maybe bug. But their immature stages, that's, you know, before they reach their adults, um, they're going to eat many more insects than the adults. So in some cases, the adults feed on something entirely different, like we're talking about the lace wings, um, where they're going to feed on nectar or pollen. Now, the parasitoids, that's, that, well, we'll say it's these guys here. Um, these are my favorite, and anytime you see, like, a, an alien movie, they're really emulated after these parasitoid insects. And the funny thing is, is they're very, very tiny. So you really need a, a hand lens to see the, these insects because they truly are like, they're micro, they're called micro wasps. But um, these are very host specific. Um, what they do is they lay their egg inside, like this is, you know, this was earlier. It, it lays its egg inside of that aphid. It, you know, it hatches out, then it starts feeding on that aphid. That aphid then becomes mummified. It dies and it gets all bloaty and brown. And then when that, that, wasp pupates it's going to come out as an adult um, so just such a such a cool uh the whole life cycle is pretty amazing um so others are wasps so this is kind of going to be a predator um but we kind of put it in with the toys a little bit because what they do is that these are our ground wasps so these are um, hornets and, and yellow jackets and what they do is they um, paralyze and they mainly go after caterpillars so they're fairly host specific as well They'll take and they'll paralyze that caterpillar. They drag it back to their nest and they will either lay an egg on it or around it. And as soon as that, that egg hatches out, that caterpillar is still alive, but it's been paralyzed. So it can't go anywhere. And so then the, that, that larvae then feeds on that caterpillar and then will eventually pupate out and become a, an adult wasp. Um, other, another bucket that we have are the tritivores. Um, so these are our, our detritivores, our decomposers. Um, these are the cleaners and the recyclers of the world. They're really important in helping to break down dead organic matter. Um, that's like the leaf litter that's going to accumulate on the ground, um, gets broken down by these guys. And then those nutrients are then recycled and become available, you know, back to those surrounding plants. Um, so it's really kind of, you know, they produce nature's fertilizer, right? So you know, it's always better to use compost before using a fertilizer. And then finally, the pollinators. And I left these guys for last because we're going to talk about these in a minute. So without these guys, um, life is going to be very boring and very drab. And um, those are the guys we're going to talk about now. But first, I want to just 
ask you guys. You can either, you can um, put in the chat box if you have any idea what this might be. Um, you know, is this a caterpillar having a bad hair day? Is it, you know, <laughs> always saying a caterpillar with caterpillar acne. But um, if, if you have any, any sort of an idea, I'll, I'll give it like 10 seconds and then I'll tell you what it is. Mindy, is it gone? But can you still hear me? I can hear you. Okay, good. Um, so um, <laughs> I, w I was waiting for her to, to mention. So we're getting um, various answers in the chat. Um, and uh, based on an earlier conversation, I'm not surprised that Mrs. Kemble was able to say hornworm because uh, she had a student that was very good at um, gathering those for her. Yeah. Um, and then um, Deb Walker mentioned parasites. Um, someone else had mentioned, um, um, Melvin asked about wasp larvae. Um, Susan asked about eggs on caterpillar. Ava said parasite wasp eggs. So what exactly. are we looking at? You guys are great. <laughs> it's exactly what it is. So these are all parasitoids. And what had happened was that the, um, the wasp had laid the egg inside. And this is basically, it, it's, it's a dead caterpillar at this point. And these are gregarious. So meaning that, that it's a type of the wasp that normally a wasp is only gonna lay one egg in one organism so that that one egg is going to survive and feed only on that, you know, be the only one feeding. With this, this type of a wasp lays a ton of eggs. And so what happens is that these have been feeding and now they have actually come up through holes and are pupating out. So this caterpillar is dead and these now will all be parasitoids, right? So these are all beneficial wasps that are then going to go out and lay eggs on other hornworms. So it's, you know, feel bad for the, for the hornworm, but, you know, <laughs> just fed, you know, 30. Feel so bad for our tomato plant. <laughs> just for a short period of time. So. Um, so Carol, a quick question of that with, um, when, when those open and those wasps come out, um, is that sometimes when you're outside and you see like that fluffy thing somewhere? Fluffy thing. Um, <laughs> <laughs> you know, my technical terms, <laughs> this is why I'm not an agent. Um, so when those open, when the wasps come out, is that, um, sometimes when you are out um, outside and you see like kind of like not to say that it looks like cotton but do you know what I mean well the cotton a lot of times is going to be mealybug so um, that cotton is going to be mealybug is a is a kind of a cousin to the, to a scale um, it's it's it walks around but what happens is they form those little cotton um, they look like little cotton balls usually in the in the crook of the, the um, of the plants or on the back side of the leaves and then they lay their eggs inside. So those are all pest insects. So, yeah. but there are other things that do cause a cottony type, um, you know, um, coverage or harborage, but it just depends. I would have to look at it, but. Okay. okay, so on to pollinators. Now the final bucket, pollinators. So pollinators are extremely important to our ecosystem. We know that um, as well as to our food supply. Although we tend to think of like butterflies and bees being pollinators, there are actually quite a few different insects, such as like flies and moths and beetles and wasps, even mosquitoes to a point. <laughs> but they're in the they're they're a, they're a fly, right? Um, but all those help pollinate our landscape plants and flowers. However, it is the honeybee that's our primary pollinator of much of the food that we eat, as well as the food for you know, a lot of our pets and our livestock. So not only do bees take on that task of pollinating our plants um, and, our, and our food plants, they also provide us that very yummy, fabulous sweet treat called honey, right? So um, they give to us um, in, in more than one way. So out of every three bites that you take, one, one of those is going to be pollinated by the honeybee. So they are incredibly important insects and one that, one that we really need to do our best to help conserve and support. Um, and that's mainly by doing things like planting really awesome, you know, flowering plants in our garden so that they have an a, a alternative food source and also to decrease the use of pesticides. So um, we're going to circle back around to that pesticide thing again, um, you know, a little bit later. 
but um, honeybees, you know, it's great when you know, we see the honeybee boxes and that, but these bees kind of need year-round uh, support, right? And so not only having our, our trees and that for them to, or our, our, our food crops, but having those, those alternative um, plants um, and flowers for them to, to have an alternative food source is, is so, so important. And bees love the, the color blue. So blue and indigo type colors are, are really, really attractive to bees. Okay, so we're gonna have a little fun. This is where you guys are gonna go make my guinea pig. So, um, you know, holidays coming up. I thought we'd have a little 4th of July picnic. So, you know, we have some fresh chips and guacamole. We have two types of macaroni, uh, you know, pasta salads because I'm kind of an overachiever and I love my carbs. Um, we're having a really yummy hamburger here, right? With all the fix-ins. Have ourselves a nice glass of uh, big, you know, uh, freshly squeezed orange juice, some fresh watermelon, um, then some cantaloupe, and then a big old berry pie. But before we dig into our picnic, we need to figure out which of these we can actually eat if there were no bees around. So what we're going to do, let me go to the next slide. What I want you to do is go up to annotate. So on your, on your toolbar, you all have a little thing that says annotate. And then you can grab the stamp and for everything that that um, does not need pollinating, let's see, that does not need pollinating, let's do a check. So I'm just going to put it down here. So there you go. Everything that does need pollinating and would have to go that we couldn't eat it, put a big X. So put it over the um, the food that you're you know that you're looking at. Yeah, you can do that too, when that's, that's fine. Um, and then I broke down the hamburger, right? Because there's a lot of vegetables in there. And don't worry about, you can, you can, you know, put your little X over somebody's X. This is just to kind of get an idea of what's going on. And if you don't see annotate as a direct option, um, it may be under like view options. Um, but it looks like a lot of y'all have yeah. found. I said it's probably best the thing is just, uh, let's just say the things that have to go. Yeah, let's just keep it to, to the uh, things that need to be pollinated. These are good, man. We're not going to eat very much. <laughs> <laughs> I just see little flashes of names. So I'll wait till the names stop flashing and I'll, I'll move on. You guys are good, good, good. I'm impressed on how quickly they find Anna. I know. They're still <laughs> beyond ours. And so I'm They're teachers, of course. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So this was a big old yummy picnic. Now, the things that we can eat. Oh, sorry about that, Alec. There you go. Okay. The things that, okay, this is going to be our picnic without bees. Come on. Change. Oh, <laughs> I like this. <laughs> so I'm gonna let me see. Let me erase. How do I erase this? Um, I leave them for a second okay. just to see where we were. How yeah. well we've done accuracy. So pretty amazing. So here's the thing: we we now have a cheese and tomato and lettuce hamburger, hamless burger. <laughs> so we don't get to eat the beef because alfalfa needs to be pollinated by bees, and so. Cows eat alfalfa, so we won't have any of our, our big beef patty. And even if we had a veggie burger, right, maybe some of those veggies that go into making that veggie burger need to be pollinated by bees as well. Um, we do have ketchup because tomatoes are actually self-pollinating, although they, they do do better with bees and they, they, you know, they can be helpful, but it is self-pollinated. However, you guys were right, mustard had to go. Of course, we lost our yummy berry pie and our watermelon and our cantaloupe and our guacamole. So now we have mm -mm -mm, macaroni, <laughs> chips, and we have about half of a glass of orange juice because although orange trees are self-pollinating, the research has shown that they actually produce 
only 35% of the fruit when they don't have bees. So bees are really, really productive for orange trees. You know, orange trees don't need them, you know, but they do a lot better in fruit production when the bees are around. So with that, I prefer to have my picnic with everything. <laughs> so we clear, there we go. So with these, we get to have a full on carb loaded, yummy 4th of July picnic. I love your I love your happy bees. The <laughs> facial expressions are, are adorable. So this is just um, these are just um, some of the most common crops um, and ones that do require bees for pollination. So without bees, like I said, um, life is going to be pretty darn drab and boring because I certainly don't like to eat macaroni without a lot of vegetables in it. How do we protect bees, um, but still try to control the insects in the garden? So we know that bees are not the only beneficial insects, and that many are there to help pollinate plants as well as control insects in the garden landscape. So how do we get rid of them without harming the beneficials? Well, this is through bio-rational products. So this is all, you know, and I, I, I put this out there because um, not so much just, you know, I, I understand the, the challenges of school gardens, and these are things that you wouldn't want to be spraying when, you're, when your students are there, but maybe something you would, you would, if you need to use them, using them, like at the you know, end of a Friday after school's out, you can spray your, your garden, and then come Monday, you know, it's going to be even, even Friday, you know, three hours later, it's going to be no problem, but, you know, if it needs it, you may be able to use some of these, but, um, so if the predators and parasitoids are having a hard time keeping up with controlling those pests, um, the option is using chemical control. The biorationals are better and safer for us and for the environment. Um, they're usually made of uh, natural products, or sometimes they are synthesized from natural products or they mimic natural products, but they have some really good characteristics. So they do things like if they break down quickly in the environment, um, they're a lot you know, less toxic to non-target organisms, right? You, the things that you don't want to be spraying when you're using conventional chemicals, sometimes you end up, right, you, you end up affecting those non-target organisms. So biorationals don't do that. There is no residue, so, or residual. So once you spray it and it dries, they're gone. So, excuse me, the main, uh, the main way that they work is on contact. Some of them work through contact and ingestion. Um, I'll talk about which ones of those are. Um, but basically, it's really something you have to spray it. You have to get full coverage. And it it works really well because most of them are suffocating the insect. That's kind of their that mode of action is through suffocation. So these are really good products. And you know, the insects have a, usually do not build up any sort of resistance like they would to a conventional chemical. So these are just a few examples. So we have things like board oils, um, so horticulture oils, um, beam oils. Then we have, my, these are called microbial products. So these are actually bacteria. So these are good bacteria. So those are things like Bt, um, Bacillus syringensis. I can never say it right. And then spinosin are two really, really good. They use these in mosquito control as well. And then things like our insecticidal soaps. So all of these are all, you know, this is only a small suite of, of the biorational products, but these are the ones that, if you were to use, would probably be the most common ones you would use in, in the garden. So again, they have uh, very low impact on, on beneficial insects, and most of them do require that you get complete coverage of the pest insect. Um, so that means, again, spraying both the top and the bottom of the leaves to give you some really good coverage. And um, again, you know, you're not gonna really, you're not going to want to spray these in, you know, when your students are around. But again, you know, on a late Friday, maybe the weekend. But once you spray it and it dries, they're no longer they're, they're, you know, There's no uh, residual, so it's it's gone. If you wanted to know more about these, I actually have another class that I teach about directly on uh, specifically on fire rationals. But again, I'm I'm happy to help you directly if, if you uh, want help that too. So. What I want to end with is insect observation equipment. So 
this stuff is really good. I am just a crazy when it comes to bugs. Um, I stop in my tracks when I see a bug. I, I really do. Um, and I'll tell you one thing. I cannot, whoops, am I writing? I cannot be without my my hand lens. So I have these sitting around my house in my car like I do in my, my readers. So I always want to have one in arm's length because I, one, can't see very much anyway. But two, most of the things that you're looking at when you're looking at insects are going to be really small. So having these hand lenses, and they're really cheap. These, these ones in particular are a dollar a piece. These are a little bit more expensive, um, between um, 8 to $15 but they're worth their weight in gold. Um, other things that are really good to have, mason jars, really cheap, right? Um, buy them by the dozens. And what you do is you get a piece of cloth and then you use the ring, not, not, the, not the center piece, but just the ring to hold that, that piece of cloth on. And these ma mason jars make really, really good observation uh, jars for, you know, you go, you get your insect net. This is another thing that's really great. Um, Get your insect net, you put them into your observation jar, you know, you, you discuss what you're seeing, what you think it might be, is it good, is it bad, is it a, an adult or is it a, a larval stage, and, you know, you want to keep that alive and then you can release it. So these, I would say these were the three pieces of equipment that will be fabulous for you and for your students um, to just get a conversation going. And the great thing about these nets, not just for butterflies, right? We always think about looking at the big stuff. You take this and you sweep it over the very tops of plants, and then you'll see when you get down to the bottom, you'll get it all in this bottom part, and you'll see you probably have, you know, tens of little flying insects, and a lot of those parasitoid wasps are going to be in there. And then you can start looking at them with your hand lens through your, through your, your jar. So... I suggest these are, are as a great uh, resource um, for, for any teacher. Um, I have a ton of them here that I use for my, my classes as well. So with that, I just wanted to end with this to see if you guys remember which ones are the good ones and which ones are the bad ones. So if, uh, maybe if you wouldn't mind yep. watching the full of them. Yeah. Uh, bear with me one moment. I'm just looking for, there we go. <laughs> Mm -hmm. See, we told you you guys were the guinea pigs, so <laughs> I apologize. <laughs> and then, um, so, uh, yes, if they can go ahead and complete the poll, um, one, two, three, four, five, six, good bug, bad bug. And then also I did put in the chat a link for, um, like, uh, a, a UF link for pollinator-friendly plants. Um, and then I'm also on a page with, that has your biorational um, mm -hmm. links, and I'm just looking at As I say, I can get you those resources. Um, there are EDIS, so the, the UF has their uh, electronic uh, data information uh, system, and they have some really fabulous, uh, fat, basically their fact sheets, their documents, and there's one on biorational products, there's one on... Um, on um, pest insects in the garden, as well on integrated pest management. So it's a real fabulous um, um, resource, the EDIS documents, whatever you, you need, you just type it in the search bar and it will pull it up for you. Um, let's see. Okay, okay 52, way to go. <laughs> And with that, get this. All right. I want to say thank you all for letting me talk about bugs today. I haven't got to talk about bugs in a while, so this was a this is a great uh, program to be able to do uh, you know, later in the week. And I'm going to stop sharing. <laughs> I'm going to share results. Um, I don't know if you got to see them in real time. Uh, yeah, I did. It. Um. I think we had people that were more confident in responding, which is yeah. good. <laughs> um, so they were actually all good bugs. So. Ah, all right. <laughs> they were true so, questions. Now, if you had said it exactly like that earlier, I might have, I, yeah. So, um, and then I did put in the, the chat 
the Eventbrite registration. So if somebody wants to have um, longer class learning about biorationals, because um, as much as this is oriented towards school gardens and it's something good to know, but I know a lot of folks do have yards and things at home and maybe they want some more detail. Um, so that's linked in there um, and it's for the one date, but if you scroll all the way down, if the, that date doesn't work for you, um, there's other dates listed. And then also um, the edible gardening page. Um, I did put that yeah. because you also had a lot of sessions in the edible gardening page where you talked about aphids and spider mites and mm -hmm. all sorts of things. Um, yeah, so, the edible gardening would be a great space for the school gardens. Mm -hmm. So um, here I can, I'm going to show it next screen, but um, or next session, but in case somebody can't um, uh, attend, let me see if it's doing it now. Um, can you see it, the edible gardening page? Yep. Okay, so um, on the page I put in the link um, where you, um, in your search engine, type edible gardening in Sarasota and, and it should pop up. Um, but there's 25 episodes and then um, subsequent support information. And um, our agriculture agent, uh, Sarah, um, which is a, a vacancy we currently have. So if you know somebody that wants to be an agriculture agent, uh, let us know. Um, but Sarah and Carol did a great job creating a library, like a reference library. And so there's all sorts of um, videos in here. And so some of them are about beneficial insects, nematodes, um, and then also finding and identifying insects and, um, and more. So um, white fly, which is rather common here, um, aphids. So, um, so if you liked this talk, um, you would like some of these um, additional reference pieces. Um, and being that kids do enjoy learning about bugs, it's kind of, yeah. Kind and of, a good thing, um, it, you know, what, what I can say, you know, when talking about integrated pest management, um, scouting and monitoring is a big part of integrated pest management and in the gardens especially because, you know, things happen so fast and we usually are, you know, we, 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 we feed our, our plants fairly well because they're short term. And so that means that they're that more that more succulent to those pest insects. So scouting and monitoring, you know, having your students go out and that should be a kind of one of the first things they do when they get in the garden is to go. And when you're scouting, you need to turn over a leaf, right? As I was saying, those things are small, they hide, they're camouflaged. You can't just walk through a garden and go, oh, everything looks great because when you start looking behind things, right? Um, and you start looking with your hand lens, you're going to realize that you you know you may have the starting of an infestation and that's where you then can use your cultural practices and you know, you pick off that leaf and you've just stopped a, a whole infestation from happening so um you know if that's anything I, that's, a, that's something i, I definitely uh, would uh, like you to take home is to is to you know getting your students to to look every day at what the garden looks like you know underneath the leaves not just on top of the leaves or what the you know the the fruits looking like so thank you so much and then um do you guys by chance have a, a thought on the um and same thing for for the folks attending um favorite things that you like to have um for your pollinators like is there a plant that you were like that's the plant that brought the pollinators so you're welcome to put it in the chat and then Carol and Wilma, if you have a, a preference for um, for what you think is a friendly one for pollinators. I put in whatever Wilma tells me to. <laughs> <laughs> Wilma and I make a good pair because I don't know a lot about plants, <laughs> but she does know a lot about bugs. I'll say that, but... Um, <laughs> So, um, oh, so Cheryl said firebush. Firebush, is really good, yeah. Yeah, Blur porterweed, asters. Um, I had I had borage in my yard, and oh, I gotta so. say, it held up really well to a lot of abuse. And I had a couple bees, but it wasn't until the mustard bolted, you know, it went into bloom, and then the bees finally found my yard. It was delightful. So. Um, sunflowers, Mrs. Campbell. Yeah, and, and believe it or not, I think some of the sunflowers that um, that I've sent out have been the lower 
pollen variety, and but I still think we get some some good uh, pollinators with that. Spotted horse mint. Wilma, you got to pull that one out. Now I'm. Now I'm <laughs> what does spotted horse mint look like? I'm gonna have to look this up. Spotted horse mint. So did anyone have any questions? Yeah, I, I kind of like completely skipped over that, and I apologize. Sorry, I did. I just wanted to make sure they knew where some of the follow-up information is. Um, that's great. Laura said that she likes having them scout. That started great. That's great. Because that's really, you know, you've got to see what's out there first, right? And then when you're scouting, if you find a pest insect, then you want to make sure you're looking for the beneficials, right? Because that, that's my favorite thing is like, yes, I know if I, when I find white fly in my landscape, which I know I have like right now, I've also then, I know I find at least three different uh, uh beneficial insects that are, are you know predators in my parasitoids that are that are keeping those in check. Um, I'm looking up to see if I can pull up a picture. Oh okay. All right. Do you mind if I share screen or I've been I've been screen sharing so you have been screen sharing. <laughs> <laughs> so um is that well is that what you were talking about? Yeah. Yeah, it's it's a, it's when it's blooming in the fall, it's a magnet for pollinators. To wild, it's a Florida native wildflower. Very cool. Thank you. Had, that shrimp plant is just a magnet for bees. Yeah, salvias too. Bees love. Yeah. And I love the. I do love the firebush. Missed the one that was right outside the window. <laughs> so, um, thank you so much, everybody, for attending. Please put in a question. So, the question was Is there going to be a recording available after the presentation? So, I have been, um, I've been trying to record all the sessions today. Um, and I think it's going to be up to Carol as far as the audio, um, if she's happy with it. Um, and <laughs> I mean, some of that's beyond our control. Um, so it's our new uh, <laughs> so uh, so but we do have um, them recorded. And, but I would say if things like biorational really intrigue you, I would also sign up and attend um, one of Carol's future presentations where she can get into more detail on those types of things. Um, and, um, Susan just asked a question about um, the magnification. Yes, there are different magnifications. Um, those small student hand lenses. As I say that right, my, <laughs> um, but those small ones are usually a either a six x, but I really prefer a ten x. Um, if you get anything too big, like if you get a twenty x, it's going to be your you know every little peck of a, a piece of dust is going to look huge. So ten x is a really good um, magnification to have for the hand lens. So six or ten, fifteen is great um, as well, but anything over that. Um, so 10, 10 is really good. Um, great job. Thank you, Carol. Um, and then the question about certificates. Um, so um, my plan is to reach out to the folks that registered through Eventbrite. So if you found us any way other than Eventbrite, please email me. Um, and then I can combine that information with the Zoom attendance. So then that way I know if people actually attended the sessions um, and mark for, for which ones were attended. And, and you may receive like a follow-up survey, um, which helps uh, give us information on what you found valuable in the presentations, what you learned, um, and then also helps um, re you know reassure us that you were attending. Um, so, because um, inevitably we have more folks that register than, than attend and that's just kind of part for the course. Kind of like when students are absent, you know. So, um, but thank you so much, Carol. I really appreciate you taking the time. Um, and I enjoyed our picnic and learning more about the pollinators. Because if you didn't catch it, she mentioned about mosquitoes and something about nectar. Uh, so you blew my mind the other day. And uh, <laughs> I don't think I said it in here. What I told you, yeah, I did say that they're pollinators. Um, yeah, but adult mosquitoes actually eat uh, nectar. They don't, um, only the female bites us, and that's to get her blood 
to get our blood to um, to um, for the eggs, the protein for the eggs. So, um, but other than that, they eat nectar. So. Mm -hmm. So we're not saying to keep mosquitoes, but it's, know. Not, know. <laughs> you know, it was one of those, it's a, it's a critter that I don't normally think about them having a positive side. And, you know, so that's why I always enjoy having conversations with Carol and Wilma. I learn something every time. So I'm quite fortunate. Yeah. Well, thank you all. I have another thank webinar I have to go to. Yes. Have a great you. day. Thank cool. you all very much for attending. Thank you. Um, for everybody else, uh, hopefully I'll see you at 3.30 for Dig In. And, um, and that will be the completion of the day. So thank you very much. And hopefully we'll see you at 3.30.